Hi everyone, this is Victor here. Welcome to the Intelligent Investor Channel. In this video, I'm going to talk about why the US Fed, led by Jerome Powell, will likely crash the US stock market and cause the US economy to head into a hard landing recession over the next 12 months. Just to give you some context, at the time of making this video, the entire US stock market is already in a large correction. The S&P 500 is down 18% from the most recent peak. The Nasdaq index is in a large bear market. It's down 28% from the most recent peak. A year ago, right before the current bear market, I made this video and talked about how the US Fed and high inflation will crush the US stock market. My prediction from a year ago has become true. So in this video, I'm going to talk about why the US Fed's monetary policies will crush the US stock market even more and what I will be doing in one of my personal growth stock portfolios. You'll learn about these topics in this video. First, I will talk about the great inflation period in the 1970s and explain why the current high inflation is similar to the 1970s. Second, how the US Fed will bring down inflation and crash the US stock market at the same time. Specifically, I will talk about Jerome Powell's Jackson Hole speech. And third, what is my investing strategy in this high inflation market? If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on the notification button. I will continue to make many excellent stock analysis and investing videos every week that will help you become a great investor. Also, if you like this channel and want to support it, check out my Patreon blog in the video description and become a premium member. Our goal is to create the best intelligent investor community that will help all our members grow their stock portfolios to over seven figures over time. With your support, we'll be able to stay independent hire other outstanding analysts to cover different stocks and create excellent stock analysis and investing videos every week that will help you become a great investor. The link is in the video description. Take a look, let's start. Obviously, the biggest issue in the US economy is inflation. High inflation the US Fed raising interest rates aggressively are the two biggest reasons that are crushing the US stock market and slowing down the US economy. Before I talk about how the US Fed will crush the US stock market even more, I will give you more context first. At the time of making this video, US inflation is still near a 40-year high. For example, the headline consumer price index CPI inflation was at 8.5% in July. This is down from a 40-year high of 9.1% CPI inflation rate in June. The US Fed's preferred measure of inflation is personal consumption expenditures or PCE inflation. The PCE inflation rate was at 6.3% in July. This is down from the 6.8% PCE inflation rate in June. The US Fed has a dual mandate of achieving maximum sustainable employment and price stability. Right now, the US unemployment rate is at 3.7%, which is way close to the unemployment rates right before the pandemic started. The biggest problem is this. The 6.3% PCE inflation rate is much higher than the US Fed's 2% target inflation rate. Last year, the US Fed was completely wrong about inflation being transitory or temporary. This is one of the biggest monetary policy mistakes made by the US Fed in recent years. In recent months, the US Fed has changed its wording from transitory inflation to entrenched inflation. This is a significant change because it shows that the US Fed is very worried about high inflation being entrenched and sticky in many parts of the economy. Now the US Fed has to bring down inflation to the 2% target by being much more hawkish than before, shrinking its balance sheet every month and raising interest rates aggressively for at least 2022 and 2023, even if it will cause a hard landing recession. In my opinion, I believe what is happening now is very similar to the great inflation period in the 1970s and early 1980s. High inflation was entrenched in the US economy during this period. During the peak of the great inflation period in the 1970s and early 1980s, the US CPI inflation was as high as 14%. The US Fed failed to bring down inflation for many years. In 1979, when Paul Walker became the US Fed chair, the US CPI inflation was running above 11%. He eventually raised the federal funds rate to as high as 20% to bring down inflation significantly, which of course led the US into two recessions. The recovery was very painful, but Paul Walker did the right thing to bring inflation down to around 3.7% by the time he left office in 1987. Entrenched inflation is the biggest risk in the US economy now. Having entrenched inflation is much riskier in the long run than having a hard landing recession now because it will be a lot harder for the US Fed to bring down inflation later on. So the question is, how will the US Fed bring down inflation back to 2% and will the US Fed crush the US stock market even more? I'll answer these two questions here. Before making this video, the US Fed Jerome Powell gave a very hawkish speech at Jackson Hole. His speech was much more hawkish and direct than his previous speech. 
Previously, many investors and economists believed that the U.S. Fed will start lowering interest rates in the second half of 2023, when the U.S. inflation is expected to be much lower and when the U.S. economy is expected to head into a recession. Now, Jerome Powell said that the U.S. Fed will maintain a restrictive policy stance for some time and not lose policies prematurely. This means the U.S. Fed will continue to be very hawkish, continue to raise interest rates aggressively for some time, and not lose their policies quickly even when the U.S. economy is heading into a recession. Bring down inflation to 2% is the US Fed's most important goal right now, even if it will cause a hard landing recession over the next 12 to 24 months. Having entrenched inflation is much riskier in the long run than having a hard landing recession over the short term. I will show you the most important parts of Jerome Powell's Jackson speech here. He said this, Restoring price stability will take some time and requires using our tools forcefully to bring demand and supply into better balance. Reducing inflation is likely to require a sustained period of below-trend growth. Moreover, there will very likely be some softening of labor market conditions. While higher interest rates, slower growth, and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation, they will also bring some pain to households and businesses. These are the unfortunate costs of reducing inflation. But a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. The labor market is particularly strong, but it is clearly out of balance with demand for workers substantially exceeding the supply of available workers. Inflation is running well above 2%, and high inflation has continued to spread through the economy. While the lower inflation readings for July are certainly welcome, a single month's improvement falls far short of what the committee will need to see before we are confident that inflation is moving down. We are moving our policy stance purposefully to a level that will be sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2%. July's increase in the target range was the second 75 basis point increase in as many meetings, and I said then that another unusually large increase could be appropriate at our next meeting. At some point, as the stance of monetary policy tightens further, it likely will become appropriate to slow the pace of increases. Restoring price stability will likely require maintaining a restrictive policy stance for some time. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. Then Jerome Powell went to explain what the U.S. Fed had learned during the Great Inflation Period in the 1970s and 1980s, when the U.S. CPI inflation was as high as 14%. Our monetary policy deliberations and decisions build on what we've learned about inflation dynamics, both from the high and volatile inflation of the 1970s and 1980s, and from the low and stable inflation of the last quarter century. And in particular, we're drawing on three important lessons that I'll highlight. The first lesson is that central banks can and should take responsibility for delivering low and stable inflation. Our responsibility to deliver price stability is unconditional. It's also true, in my view, that the current infl high inflation in the United States is the product of strong demand and constrained supply, and that the Fed's tools work principally on aggregate demand. There is clearly a job to do in moderating demand to better align with supply. We are committed to doing that job. The second lesson is that the public's expectations about future inflation can play an important role in setting the path of inflation over time. Today, by many measures, longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored. If the public expects that inflation will remain low and stable over time, then, absent major shocks, it likely will. Unfortunately, the same is true of expectations of high and volatile inflation. During the 1970s, as inflation climbed, the anticipation of high inflation became entrenched in the economic decision-making of businesses and households. The more inflation rose, the more people came to expect it to remain high, and they built that belief into wage and price decisions. As former Chairman Paul Volcker put it at the height of the great inflation in 1979, inflation feeds in part on itself, so part of the job of returning to a more stable and more productive economy must be to break the grip of inflationary expectations. One useful insight into how actual inflation may affect expectations about its future path is based in the concept of rational inattention. When inflation is persistently high, households and businesses must pay close attention and incorporate inflation into their economic decisions. When inflation is low and stable, they are freer to focus their attention elsewhere. Of course, inflation has just about everyone's attention right now, which highlights a particular risk today. The longer the current bout of high inflation continues, the greater the chance that expectations of higher inflation will become entrenched. And that brings me to the third lesson, which is that we must keep at it until the job is done. History shows that the employment costs of bringing down inflation are likely, likely to increase with delay as high inflation becomes more entrenched in wage and price setting. The successful Volcker disinflation of the early 1980s followed 
multiple failed attempts to lower inflation over the previous 15 years. A lengthy period of very restrictive monetary policy was ultimately needed to stem high inflation and to start the process of getting inflation down to the low and stable levels that were the norm until the spring of last year. Our aim is to avoid that outcome by acting with resolve now. These lessons are guiding us as we use our tools to bring inflation down. We are taking forceful and rapid steps to moderate demand so that com it comes into better alignment with supply and to keep inflation expectations anchored. We will keep at it until we're confident the job is done. The third lesson is the most important part. The U.S. Fed will continue to tighten its monetary policies over the next 12 months or even longer until inflation is back down to 2%. The U.S. Fed's restrictive policies will slow down the U.S. economy, lower consumer demand in the economy, increase borrowing costs for both consumers and businesses substantially, and increase the unemployment rates in the U.S. In my opinion, I believe the U.S. Fed is prepared to have a long period of very restrictive monetary policy to bring down inflation significantly. This is very similar to what former U.S. Fed Chair Paul Walker did in the early 1980s. The main difference is that our current inflation is not as high as in the 1970s. Also, our labor market is much stronger than in the 1970s. I said this in my previous videos. I believe it's nearly impossible for the U.S. economy to have a soft landing now because the U.S. inflation is still way too high above the 2% target and because the U.S. Fed will need to raise interest rates a lot higher to bring down inflation. This will increase the unemployment rate in the U.S., cause the U.S. housing market to crash or have a large correction, lower consumer spending significantly, increase buying costs for both consumers and businesses, and lower business spending and investments. In recent months, many companies have started cutting their staff because the demand for their products and services has slowed down a lot and because they expect that the U.S. economy will slow down. Also, many companies have started reporting lower earnings and lower revenue growth because of high inflation and all the macro headwinds that are affecting their businesses. I believe the U.S. Fed will cause a hard landing recession over the next 12 to 24 months in order to bring inflation down significantly. Also, I believe the U.S. Fed will likely crash the U.S. stock market even more in the upcoming quarters, mainly because the U.S. Fed will maintain a restrictive policy stands for some time, instead of loosening monetary policies prematurely. Similar to bonds, when interest rates go up significantly for some time, stock valuations must come down. This is because most businesses will report lower earnings, have lower revenue guidance, and expect lower growth going forward. If you look at the US Fed's summary of economic projections here, the Federal Open Market Committee FOMC predicted that US inflation would be around 1.9% to 2.6% in 2024. In comparison, the US PC inflation was 6.3% in July. If I have to make an agitated guess, I believe it would take the US Fed longer, probably 3 to 5 years, to bring the inflation back down to 2%. Of course, the earlier the better for everyone. During this time, the short term pain is that there will likely be a hard landing recession with higher unemployment rates. I believe the US Fed's restrictive policies will cause the US stock market to crash even more going forward until inflation is back down to around 2 to 3%. So what is my investment strategy going for in this high inflation environment? This is my updated investment strategy. My plan is to invest in many wonderful businesses at wonderful prices and invest at least 10% of my gross income in undervalued stocks every month. Instead of investing in many hyper-growth stocks that are not profitable yet, my goal is to find many outstanding high-quality businesses that have strong fundamentals, great management, large economic modes, great long-term prospects, and increasing free cash flows over time. One key difference is that I will invest in many dividend growth stocks going forward instead of many hyper growth stocks that are not profitable yet. Another key difference is that I will invest a lot more in companies such as Apple, Microsoft, and Alphabet that have the largest free cash flows each year and stay away from any companies that do not have consistent earnings and free cash flows yet. I always say this, cash flow is the king especially when the US Fed is tightening its policies. To reduce risk, I believe it's important to always invest for the long term and invest only when the stock is underway or when it's traded below its interest value. I will give you several examples here. This is one of my personal stock portfolios. I made several huge mistakes in this portfolio. For example, in 2020 and 2021, I made a huge mistake of investing in many hyper growth stocks such as Coinbase, Copan, Roblox, C Limited, Shopify, and Block because I was fear of missing out. These companies would perform very well when interest rates are near zero and when the US Fed is loosening monetary policies. But now you can see these companies are performing poorly because the US Fed is tightening policies 
commodities and is raising interest rates aggressively. Another thing is that almost all these hyper growth companies are still losing money almost every quarter. Most of them do not have consistent free cash flows and consistent earnings yet. If I can choose again, I would not invest in these companies because these companies are not profitable yet, or they do not have consistent free cash flows yet, or they do not have large economic modes yet. Good thing is that I've invested in many outstanding companies such as Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Visa, Mastercard, and Tesla in my portfolio here. In my opinion, these are very profitable businesses with strong fundamentals, great management, large economic modes, and increasing free cash flows over time. I believe their businesses will still perform well even in this high inflation market because they can often pass high costs to their customers. Recently, I sold a large position in NVIDIA and made a 40% realized scam from it. NVIDIA scamming business that sells discrete GPs to consumers will be impacted the most for the next several quarters because there's an oversupply of GPUs in the market now, right after cryptocurrencies crashed. I still have a small position in NVIDIA. I will buy back more NVIDIA shares when it becomes more underwater again. I sold my Mercado Libre shares and made an 82% realized scan. I sold it because Mercado Libre is still not a profitable business yet, even though it has a large economic mode and is the largest e-commerce marketplace in Latin America. Instead, I reinvested money in Alphabet since Alphabet is much more profitable and has a very strong free cash flow every quarter. I also sold my remaining PayPal shares and made a 52% realized scan. I decided to sell PayPal even though it's substantially undervalued because I wanted to reinvest the money in better opportunities. For example, I reinvested the money to buy more Alphabet shares. Alphabet is much more profitable than PayPal. I may buy back PayPal shares later on. I want to show you this spreadsheet here. These are my favorite companies that I want to invest in for the long term. I've listed them based on their free cash flows. Companies that have the largest free cash flow will have the largest weight percentage. Ideally, I want to have the largest weight percentage in businesses such as Apple, Alphabet, and Microsoft that have the largest free cash flow each year and have a smaller weight percentage in businesses such as Waste Management, Autodesk, and Nasdaq Inc. that have smaller free cash flow each year. I want to have a much larger weight percentage in businesses that have the largest free cash flow each year because these businesses tend to be the most competitive and most profitable in their sectors. This is why I've been investing in more Microsoft and Alphabet shares whenever they become underwhelmed in recent months. Going forward, I plan to invest a lot more in Apple, Microsoft, Visa, Mastercard, ASML, TSMC, and Tesla. I will start new positions in American Express, LVMH, Applied Materials, Name Research, and S&P Global Inc. I will buy their stocks only when they become undervalued or when their stocks are traded below their intrinsic values. You will notice that all these companies I just mentioned, except Tesla, are dividend growth companies. Tesla is the exception here. If Tesla becomes substantially underweight below my interest rate estimate here, I will buy more Tesla shares. Before investing, I always use this intrinsic value spreadsheet to calculate each company's intrinsic value, so I will know when a company becomes undervalued, fairly value, or overvalued. I believe it's important to always invest in great companies only when their stocks are traded below their intrinsic values. If you want this intrinsic value spreadsheet, you can find it in my Patreon blog in the video description. Now, all these are only my opinions and my analysis based on my research. They are not financial advice. There are always risks associated with investing. It's important to always invest in what you know and not speculate. You will need to do your own research and do your extra due diligence first before investing in anything. Thank you for watching this video and supporting our channel. This is Victor from the Intelligent Investor channel and I will see you in the next video.